Hi. Hi, my dear friends. Hi, DLD community. I'm Steffi, Steffi Czerny, the founder of DLD. Welcome to our eighth edition of DLD Think. Today, we'll be taking a deep dive into the fascinating topic of the machinery of life and the future of human evolution. The COVID-19 pandemic poses new questions, whether biotechnology and genomics can create substantial unforeseen impact for the fields of medicine and health, and of course, for society. For this debate, I'm so proud, really, really proud to welcome three outstanding experts in their fields. We'll be hearing from my good friend, Ellen Jorgensen. Ellen, I've known her since 2011, when I first visited her citizen science lab, Gen Space, in Brooklyn. We have to thank Kevin Slavin, who introduced us. Kevin, I hope you will hear us. Thank you so much for introducing me to Ellen. She is wonderful. Ellen has spoken in a DLD several times about the potential of biotech and technologies such as CRISPR. She is now the chief science officer and co-founder of biotech startup Anika, which is also co-hosting this session today. Thank you for this. Our second speaker is George Church. You all have heard about George Church. He is one of the key figures in the intersection of synthetic biology, genetics and technology. He leads synthetic biology at the Wyss Institute of Harvard, University. Um, he is a professor of the medical school in Harvard, and he is a professor of health sciences and technology at Harvard, as at MIT. Amongst his many, many achievements and groundbreaking research, he is also one of the initiators of the Human Genome Project in 1984. He is a man of wisdom, of humanity, of intelligence, of interdisciplinary things, approaches. It's, it's great to have you here. Dear George, I'm so proud that you are here. It's your first appearance, hopefully not the last one at DLD. Last but not least, I'm so happy to have Jamie Metzl at DLD Think. He is a futurist an author, a geopolitical expert, and faculty member of Singularity University, the Exponential Medical Track. He's a senior fellow of the Atlantic Council, and he was recently appointed to the World Health Organization Expert Advisory Committee on Human Genome Editing. He's a wonderful communicator, a great author, and a good, you know, um, who of you have read Hacking Darwin? If not, please read it. Was what all of us connect is our love, our, our, our sense for curiosity. I think we're all very, very curious. This is our drive. And some of you, I hope, or all of three of you are optimists. Maybe this connects us also. So, Jamie, you're a great coach. You're a great game player. Why don't you start the conversation? The floor is open. Wonderful. Thank you so much to you, uh, Steffi, uh, and welcome and hello to our, our dear friends in the DLD community. At times like this, when people are sheltering at home, this kind of connectivity, this kind of reaching out and building new networks and new relationships is really more important than ever. So really, um, I'm thrilled. I know we're all thrilled uh, to be here. Uh, Ellen and, and George, I'm really honored to be here uh, with you, George and I. This is where we're coming. Like It's like a, an act. We've done it so much together. But every time I'm with George, I always learn new things, uh, which is just wonderful. So what I thought I might do to just get our conversation rolling is go from kind of microscope to telescope, thinking about this moment. If someone asks, I think for all of us, what is the microscope? What, what is the core issue that we're spending a lot of our time focusing on? It's obviously, it's the pandemic. Uh, and this pandemic has, has un unsettled the world in a way maybe not much else has, at least uh, since, uh, since the world wars, uh, or certainly the, uh, the Spanish flu. Um, 
And we take a step back, we think that the pandemic isn't just uh, about this, uh, this virus and the outbreak, it's about something bigger that's happening on a societal level that's connected to, uh, to the virus. And I talk about this a lot, that if uh, the world is experiencing this kind of 1918 moment where we're recognizing the end of something and the beginning of something else, the virus is in many ways the equivalent of the bullet uh, that was used to assassinate Archduke Franz Ferdinand in, in uh, 1914. That there's something bigger that's happening. But when we get all the way to the telescope and we look at this moment in the context of the flow of human history, in spite of these other issues, I, I believe, and certainly I write about that and I know others uh, write about that, but the story of this moment is going to be historically that this was the time when our one little species among the billions that have ever lived um, suddenly developed these tools that were all what we had for past millennia ascribed to our gods, this ability to read, write, and hack the code of life. And certainly George and Ellen and others have been part of this, of this progression. And so the question for all of us is one, where is the uh, technology going? But ma maybe even more importantly, to recognize that these technologies uh, don't come with a built-in value system and every technology can be used to really help us and they can be abused. So what, what I'd like to, for us all to do together is go on a journey talking about the technology and its applications, but then about the ethics and how do we make sure that these technologies are used, are used wisely. So, what I thought I might do is first ask George um, to talk about this moment from a scientific perspective. Certainly when I talk about uh, genetic engineering, people say, oh, you mean CRISPR. And what I always say is, no, this moment is much bigger than CRISPR. I mean, this is what we're seeing, I think, is a super convergence of all of these mutually enabling and in inspiring technologies. But George, I, because you're such a big thinker, I have to start giving you the, the most impossible questions that I, can, uh, that I can think of to make it interesting for you and for, and for everybody else. So if you had to characterize what is unique about this moment with these super convergence of, uh, of technologies and how do you, what do you see as the drivers and how do you see in, in big picture terms within synthetic biology and biology, um, the technology playing out over the next 10 or 20 years? Thanks for the softball, Jamie. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think what the technologies have in common is they're exponential, that meaning that the uh, nanotechnology, computer, internet, biological reading, writing and editing, these are all on very steep exponential curves, maybe doubling once a year, in some cases faster than that. Uh, we've seen a 10 million fold improvement in both cost and quality for reading and writing DNA, for example, uh, in uh, just a few year time. So 10 million fold is much different than just, oh, we improve the, the, the speed of a train by uh, 5% or the agricultural gains of 2% uh, every couple of years. Uh, this is, these are factors of two to ten um, on an uh, annual basis. So that's I think that's what they have in common. The time we're living in is, is now maybe multiplied more by this COVID uh, disaster. It also almost all disasters also are catalysts for change, and the catalysts uh, you know for example we had catalysts for change that asteroid uh, brought uh, mammals uh, into more uh, uh, <clears throat> of abundance. World War II brought about, uh, you know, women's live via, via employment, rockets, uh, GPS, weather, communication satellites. So COVID is bringing us video conferencing like we have today, bio weather mapping, which is uh, has a synthetic biology component, and even considering space colonies on Earth as um, both useful on Earth and as practice for um uh, becoming citizens of, of the, the uh, solar system and the galaxy. That's, that's great. And I think that's, it's such an essential point is that the way our brains work, just for evolutionary terms, is we think 
linearly. That's how our ancestors survived in the, in the savanna. But to get our mind around exponential change, that the, that the rate of change going forward is much faster than the rate of change looking backwards, that's this conceptual jump. And it requires all of us to really almost think like science fiction writers, because from where we are today, the future looks like science fiction. So Ellen, there's the, the way the science is unfolding, and there's an expanding community of who is actually doing the science. You've been one of the pioneers of the do-it-yourself bio, DIY bio movement. How do, you, how do you see the realm and the universe of people who are pushing this science forward, expanding over the coming years? And what do you think are the implications of that? Well, first of all, I kind of want to push back on, on the idea of this moment. Um, because as you were saying it, I was thinking about, um, I'm a New York City native and I lived through 9-11. And I remember after 9-11 happened, uh, for a while, every time anyone saw a policeman or a fireman, they would thank them. Everyone was super nice to each other. <laughs> but uh, what was interesting to me, it was almost like stepping on an anthill that everything gets disturbed and everyone runs around and then everything goes back to exactly the way it was before in a lot of ways. So we're seeing this incredible technology uh, revolution and a point where a bunch of technology is being brought to bear on a, a really interesting and, and <laughs> life-threatening problem. But I wonder how societally we're actually gonna change after this. The hope is that uh, we do become more cooperative and let more people in uh, to the practice of science. And that's one thing that we're seeing right now. Um, I'm involved in some efforts to uh, bring not only uh, communities that would be thought of as um, non-traditional or amateur or um, community bio uh, together with professionals and government to try and solve some of these problems. And our biggest hope is that these connections that we're making and the pathways, the sort of the social neural pathways that we've created will survive and maybe even be applied to things like climate change in the future. Uh, our fear is that after this biotech taking the center stage and kind of saving the day, that we're gonna devolve back to the public not really caring about it and actually being a little um, scared of it. And there's always that darker narrative that we keep trying to explain to people is not the main narrative. And, and we see it now in, in this fear that the virus escaped from a lab. So uh, I, I'm hoping it's going to go in the positive direction. Uh, I mean, what do you think, Jamie? Yeah, so a few things. I think it, that, that was why I referenced 1918. Uh, there are these new technologies, uh, this new moment in history, and it could go one way or another. It, it could go very badly, uh, as happened in, in 1918, or it could go well, as happened in 1945 at the end of the Second World War. And that's the issue that's, uh, that's at, at play now. And just circling back to your, your point about, um, or my point and, and your comment about this moment, um, I do think that uh, once there's a vaccine, people are, are going to largely want to go back uh, to their lives. Um, but I think this year is a really fundamental year within the, the superstructure of how we're organized as a world. Um, there are transitional years, uh, 1648, 1848, 1918, 1945, and it's my contention, and I'm talking with Steffi and Alex about doing a, a whole DLD event on this potentially at some point in the future, is that, is that this is one of those years where the superstructure of the world changes. Um, uh, and uh, it's real, I think historically, this will be seen as the end of the post-war world, but that's, that's a topic um, for, uh, uh, for another time. Um, but I definitely feel that very, very big things are, are happening. And right now you're absolutely right. Science is at the center of this change. And what we're seeing is a virus that's moving at the speed of globalization, but we're also seeing a response that's moving at the speed of globalization, that all of these tools like this that are allowing scientists and thinkers and others uh, to come together, it's, it's a really big 
part of the problem. And that's coming back to 1918. That's the good story. Uh, that's the, the story. The, there's the Woodrow Wilson story and there's the Adolf Hitler story, both of whom saw how, how, how the world was, uh, was changing in those, in those years. So let's, let, let's transition a little bit to talk about some of the, of the applications. And again, I like to use the same model of going uh, uh, microscope to, to telescope. So with microscope, let's talk about, um, about COVID and, and the treatment. So um, when we're thinking about, not just treatment, the use of all of these technologies to address this, uh, this problem. George, if you could talk a little bit of kind of the, the continuum of, sci of applications of uh, synthetic biology um, to treating COVID, going uh, from uh, surveillance uh, to uh, treatment uh, to, uh, to vaccine. Can you talk a little bit about what you, what you see as the cutting edge of where we are and where we could be? Great. Uh, <clears throat> I may actually go the opposite direction, going starting with treatments and vaccines. So, so we need to have a multi-prong ap approach, and my lab is working on almost everything that I'm going to mention, uh, every way that you can do it. But uh, the problem with declaring victory that once we have a roadmap is that it does, that doesn't always go, the road doesn't always go where the roadmap uh, was intended. So, for example, uh, HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria still do not have effective uh, drugs and vaccine, in particular vaccines. Uh, some of the drugs develop multi-drug resistance with, with time. Uh, there are other ones where it works spectacularly, like smallpox. Not only did the vaccine work, but we don't even need the vaccine anymore because it's extinct. So they've got this kind of this big gulf uh, with everything in between um, it, that, that respond to vaccines uh, or not. That, so we're going to need, but we don't know how COVID is going to work. We could have a vaccine that gets rid of it temporarily or doesn't work at all, like the three examples I gave. Uh, we can have one that makes it worse. So the, the, we're just uh, publishing a paper on antibody-dependent enhancement where the antibodies bind to the outside of the virus, and then that allows to access uh, to a different class of cells, not just the long, long pneumocytes, but uh, some of the leukos blood leukocytes. Uh, now you have a worse disease. Uh, so in it, the rest of the portfolio has to be about testing. All the countries that currently have no uh, problems or have very, very low problems, and even individual towns like Vo in Italy, um, it's because of testing. Um, we get excited about gene editing, but the real uh, secret weapon in inherited disease is reading the genome. Reading the genome is much, much less expensive. It, uh, gene therapy is a million dollars per dose. Uh, reading the genome is $300. Um, and that applies to, to, uh, coronavirus and many other, we, we should be analyzing, we shouldn't be making, shouldn't just be making very specific, um, diagnostics that we made up on the spur of the moment that, that, that just does one thing very narrowly. We should also have some breadth. So we, we check out antibody and antibiotic and antiviral resistance. We check out, uh, vaccine or, or immune re resistance, um, and we check out multi-pathogens at once. That's what I call the bioweather map. It's something very inexpensive relative to the $6 trillion we're going to spend on one virus um, doing the bioweather map on all pathogens um, is 10,000 times cheaper, even if we do it in a very uh, thorough way, giving everybody access. So, Ellen, you've been a pioneer in thinking differently about how we apply this kind of science. So when you hear what George is saying, and definitely the, the, we're, we're seeing these trillion dollar things and these hundred dollar things, and it's, it's not guaranteed that the trillion dollar things will give us trillion dollar of return on in investment and the hundred dollar things will give hundred dollar return on investment. If we all recognize this is just a revolutionary moment in, in how we, we think about solving problems, and we were to turn this thing, this our, our problem solving mind around to say, well, it's, it's not a government fund, but something that's more from the bottom up, how might we think differently about, about solving this crisis in a way that leads into being better able to address future pandemics, broader public health and health? 
Well, I'm all about distributed biotech. And um, it's, to me, acting locally is the key. Um, and one of the things that's difficult, of course, is that there has to be some sort of standardization and some sort of quality control on actions that lead to decisions around health. But that said, um, it would be nice if there were uh, easier pathways to being able to um, to achieve that 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 kind of certification or standardization because uh, there are a lot of labs, um, either small startups like Anika or uh, it, labs that are community labs, where really great ideas are coming out of and. Um, and they could be applied locally. So for example, at Anika, we're doing environmental testing for COVID-19. And uh, we're also involved in this collaborative project that I mentioned before to develop um, a, a, an isothermal amplification-based test for COVID-19, which is a test that is much simpler and doesn't require ex as expensive machinery as the tests that are right, right now on the market. And uh, getting to the point where you have a test that is working is one thing. Getting to the point where you're allowed to actually perform that test or actualize it, or even allow people who have some training to perform it on themselves, if it's an easy enough test, uh, can be a barrier. And I'm not saying we should open the doors and make uh, have it be a free for all. Uh, we've sort of seen what happened with the antibody testing companies. But there should be some middle ground or some way uh, to make that happen. I, I just yeah. want to see more local action. Yeah, I, I think it's so essential. When you, if you're, my view is if you're going to have a top-down system, which I don't, in, in all situations, it's not what I recommend. Um, but at least do it like they just did testing in Wuhan. If you're going to have a bottom-up system where everybody is responsible for testing themselves and figuring out whether they should go to work or send their kids to school, at least have, give people the tools to make those decisions wisely. I think the United States, we're just kind of stuck in this middle where we're not doing top down effectively. We haven't empowered the bottom up and even very well intentioned people don't have the data or the information to, to, uh, to act responsibly. So George, uh, near Barzilai had a, a piece that came out a few weeks ago in Leaps. Um, and you know, for those of us who are, who are doing, thinking a lot about uh, the, our ability to disrupt, as, as you are, um, to slow uh, the aging process or to enhance health span, uh, there are some people who've been thinking about this as, well, it's a bunch of rich people in, in Silicon Valley. But when we see the extreme discrimination um, of this pandemic and the way it's hitting, uh, our older uh, populations more aggressively in many cases than younger ones. My view is it's, it, this is, it could be a time to think differently about the science of aging, uh, because if we're attacking this, uh, this pandemic, there are two ways, essential ways to, one is to go after the virus and one is to strengthen the hosts. So George, can you talk a little bit about how the science of aging um, applies to kind of fortifying people um, to be able to put up stronger defenses against the virus. Yeah, I think what people sometimes forget about aging, even if you, even if there's no intention to go beyond our current maximum lifespan, uh, if it, it's just about health, aging affects almost every disease, whether they're common or rare, whether they are uh, complex or simple. Um, even things you don't even think about as diseases like falling over is affected by aging. Your probability of falling over goes up and your follow probability of not getting up goes up with age. Um, it infects almost every infectious disease is, is uh, because your immune system is um, shrinking in its ability with time. A lot of things that were high in youth, uh, proteins and antibodies and so forth uh, sink with time. So. Uh, I think from a cost effectiveness standpoint, for a humane treatment standpoint, for just having a good medical portfolio, we should be working on it. And from an economic standpoint, it's good economics because uh, if we're increasingly going after orphan drugs, and I'm glad that there are orphan drugs in the Orphan Drug Act, but they're million dollars per dose. Um, well, if you have a drug that 
impacts everybody. Um, and aging does impact everybody. Uh, even, even young people uh, have diseases they don't get when they were younger. Uh, then now you've got something where the fixed costs of R&D are divided by the denominator that's going up. That's as, as big a denominator as you can get if it's a drug that is used preventatively by the whole population. Yeah, so it's it's such an important point. I mean, I, I, and and I also coming back to to Ellen's comment. This is the, this is one of those moments where we can think differently and we can do differently because so many systems that were just stuck because of inertia suddenly are are unstuck and that's there's a creative moment that's happening and hopefully we can make it good creative so now i have i i started ellen uh, asking uh, george an impossible question uh, but now i'm going to ask both of you a, it's i mean it's actually possible but it's uh difficult um we know what human beings are right now i mean we are very very similar uh to our ancestors a thousand ten thousand twenty thousand years ago uh, we have, as George uh, points out, we have some superpowers um, like our vaccinations and our glasses and and healthcare and and all these things that are actually not in this country, but in in Germany, where your healthcare actually helps you live longer. Um, so imagine with all the tools uh, that we have at our disposal, and where those tools uh, and capabilities um, uh, are you believe heading. What will a human being look like 200 years from now? And what do you think the difference between that person biologically and us biologically will be? Question for both of you. Starting with you, Ellen. Oh, thanks. Uh, interesting. Well, um, this is again, future speculation. And uh, my, my my view of the future isn't necessarily, you know, this is my personal view. It isn't necessarily representative of my company. I want to lay that right out. So I think we absolutely have to embrace um, genetic modification of humans wholeheartedly if we're going to survive on this planet. Um, unless something radically changes about our mindset, we are going to change the climate on this planet so severely that it's, it's going to be change or die. And the tools that we have to affect rapid change rather than waiting for evolution to weed us out uh, are here right now. Um, they have not been widely used, but they're in the process of being proven uh, to be, I think, eventually reasonably safe, or at least the risk benefit ratio will become reasonable at some point in time when our backs are up against the wall. So I think that we are going to be, if we are still around in 200 years, we are going to be much better versions of ourselves physically and hopefully mentally as well. Um, and I think science is going to play, play a huge role in that. There, there are going to be some really painful decisions along the way. There are going to be some terrible mistakes made but I, I have faith uh, in the end. Um, and I think it's very strange that people seem to think of a typical scientist as someone who's enamored by the technology and not by the, the humanity of what they do. Most scientists are middle-class people who got into it because they wanted to help and because they loved discovering things and they loved applying them to the world in a positive way. So uh, I have to think that ultimately, science is going to help us survive into the next 200 years. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great answer. And it's ironic because, I mean, my book, Hacking Darwin, is about this. I think we all live in this world where this is kind of the big question. And yet it's very uncomfortable uh, for people. And people say, oh, like, you can't play God as if God, if there is a God, had intended for almost 8 billion humans to be colonizing the entire planet and paving the, uh, the forests and doing all these things that, uh, uh, th uh, that we do. And then I also wonder why people are so enamored with every aspect of our current biology with all of its bugginess that I mean, evolution is, is not, it doesn't have an inherent direction. And so it's always throwing up mutations and some of them from our perspective are helpful and some of them are harmful. 
And traditionally, we call the harmful mutations fate, but we don't want that fate. If somebody's kid has a, a deadly genetic disorder, we don't say, oh, that's fate too bad. We say, well, let's bring our best science to fix it. And that's a- my But it is a slippery slope. It is a slippery slope. And George, yeah. George has made some nice comments about not yeah. cutting off the sides of the bell curve. No, I agree. I agree with that. And we'll, we'll talk about ethics in, in a moment. Um, but life is also a slippery slope. You, know, you, ask, you ask somebody out on a date, three years later, you end up married. So George, humans 200 years from now. Well, you, you specifically asked about uh, biological change. And I just want to emphasize biological change could be quite extreme without affecting the germline. You can inherit, uh, we have inherited all sorts of things without altering our germline that much. Uh, and so for example, there, there will be uh, gene therapies that are applied in the adult or in your child once worn without affecting the germline. There will be biohybrids. So we're not going to be, when we say a biological change, if that includes uh, implantable devices or even wearable devices, um, that that will change us as beings. I think we're already quite different um, from our ancestors. Um, in in many ways, it can only be described as being bio hybrids uh, with a complex system. I think climate change is going to be a big um, deal that we 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 um, affect during the uh, uh, next uh, two hundred years. And but it isn't necessarily changing our body because uh, we could change. Our housing, we could change. We could fight the climate change itself. Uh, the uh, um, engineering, say the Arctic, uh, one of my favorite uh, pastimes, and uh, and I think over, uh, above all, what we're aiming for is probably higher diversity. Not so that we have, not that everybody looks the same or uh, is radically different from the way they are now, but a uh, but a great deal of not not ancestral diversity so much as biological diversity. There's no perfect human. It's like there's no perfect transportation. We will have um, many different uh, biological and biohybrid uh, ways of uh, adapting to things like space colonization. So in terms of our survival, maybe not 200 years, it's hard to say there's a big time uncertainty, but at some point we're sitting ducks. The asteroid or volcano or solar flare could wipe out um, our civilization, if not all life. And uh, we need to have a backup. We need to have a lot of backups throughout the solar system and galaxy. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And, and I think that that's, again, we're getting into the area of that makes people uncomfortable, but we have to really think big about what are our future needs. And if you think that there's a possibility, which I think we all know that that's the case, that that this planet is eventually going to become unlivable, uh, that there could be you know, life-threatening events like the ones that, that George mentioned. What's our responsibility to start planning and, and building toward that potential future? At the same time, we need to do it, and we'll see just in our last few uh, couple of minutes before we open up uh, for questions which are already being uh, submitted uh, from the, the viewers, um, to recognize that this is very ethically challenging territory, uh, that there are big issues of equity. Who has access to these kinds of, uh, of technologies? We're, we're seeing it now with questions about who has access uh, to a vaccine if we, uh, if we have one, uh, who has access to basic healthcare and nutrition and housing and education, which are already you know, defining elements of our civilization now. But as we move into the future with these these more profound applications or differently profound applications of technology, who has access? George mentioned diversity. Uh, everybody recognizes that diversity is the sole survival strategy of our species. Without it, we wouldn't even be single cell organisms. It's just those single cell organisms wouldn't have made it uh, very far. And yet, um, societally, we are great stakeholders in diversity. But individually, our sense of diversity exists within a social context. And so if the, is every person who has a deadly single gene mutation disorder are part of that diversity, and if we're, if we're going to call on people to be carriers of diversity that they, for whatever reason, see as 
harmful uh, to, to them or to their children, that's going to be a really tough conversation. So just in the last minute before we open up to the wonderful questions, we're already getting into the viewers, Ellen, then, uh, then George. Um, if you had to say what do you think is are the one or two most important things that we can do now uh, to make sure that our ethical considerations are best woven in uh, to our decision making about how to apply these technologies, what would those applications be? Wow, that's a tough one. I mean, it's 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 easy to say that that ethics should be involved every step of the way in research. And there's a lot of attempts to involve ethicists in scientific meetings and in grant reviews and in discussions, and also to um, to get the, the, the public involved. And, uh, you know, I did spend the last 10 years of my life basically trying to make sure that the public was even aware of things like CRISPR, because the average person on the street had no idea uh, that the first human had been edited um, in 2017. So... Uh, that's part of it, but there's always that, how do you make the go, no go decision on something? And I don't think anyone has a really good answer on that, or maybe George does, but um, I certainly don't. And I've been in some very heated discussions. Uh, there was one meeting where a scientist actually stood up and shouted at an ethicist and said, give me one example where the inclusion of, of people like you actually resulted in a better outcome in the end. Um, and another where they, they, they stood up and said, well, democracy doesn't necessarily work. Um, you know, look, look at, look at what, ha as what it's, has what happened in a lot of countries when people were just allowed to, to vote for whoever they wanted to, uh, without any caveat that they had to actually understand what the person stood for. So it's, there is no perfect system. Um, all I can say is communication and dialogue and try to work things out. George? Yeah, I'll, I'll answer this and, and I'll begin to answer some of the questions that are coming in through the chat channel uh, because they overlap this question. Uh, so uh, I think we have a fairly good system uh, where of practical ethics, which is uh, things like the Food and Drug Administration and the EPA. We need to bolster those. We need to make them stronger rather than invent something brand new necessarily. Uh, although some diversity in decision making is good as well, um, but these are these are our 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 way that we protect ourselves from a coronavirus vaccine, for example, that doesn't work or that causes antibody dependent enhancement or only la only lasts for a few months. They're the watchdogs that we need to uh, enable uh, so that, that we get the 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 uh, risks to a minimum and the risks typically if. If it's done properly, you put a very small number of people at risk in the first uh, clinical trials, uh, and very and often they're quite uh, desperate and they're uh, and they need something anyway, uh, and then you just slowly build up. We need uh, to enable the EPA and the FDA and their equivalents uh, worldwide to think longer term, but that's not. That's not qualitatively different. That's just uh, we need to be constantly collecting data. Um, access. I mean, I think that people, one of the biggest ethical questions <clears throat> is not just uh, whether we should do it or not, but how do we do it in such a way that if it does work out, everybody has access. So smallpox is, is one of the few technologies that literally everybody on the planet has access because they don't even have to take a drop of vaccine anymore. It's just extinct. Uh, cell phones was something where initially the ultra rich had them because you needed a, a, a car to carry it around. It was so big. Um, and the ultra rich were taking a risk that it was going to melt their brain. There was actually quite a bit of uh, sort of uh, tinfoil conspiracy theories that, that cell phones would melt your brain and the rich people were, were taking a chance on it anyway. I think that that was quickly de-risked and it quickly became democratized so the point that that now people have access to some kind of telecommunications technology at a minimum by borrowing it from their neighborhood um, so I, I look forward to the other questions in the yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. And, and so, I, and these are really great questions. We have a lot of them on our, on our chats and I hope uh, people won't mind uh, rather than reading them verbatim, uh, we're, we're seeing them and we'll incorporate them into our, uh, into our conversation. But what I thought I might, I might add to George, what you were saying on a national level, um, one of the questions is about how do we think about addressing uh, this challenge of fighting pandemics on a global level? As Steffi said in the beginning, I'm a member of the World Health Organization International Advisory Committee on Human Genome Editing. And for that, uh, that reason, um, when all of this uh, madness uh, started coming out about blaming the, uh, the WHO for this pandemic, I was doing a lot of, uh, of, of interviews and, and um, writing a, lo a lot about that. And, and certainly um, we can imagine easily how this pandemic could have been stopped in its tracks. Um, one, uh, Ellen, uh, you mentioned the origin story. It's my personal view that this, it could very easily have been an accidental outbreak from one of the Wuhan virology labs. Uh, there's a big and an open debate about that, but whatever the, whatever the origin, clearly if uh, the great, seemingly great surveillance uh, and response system that China had set up after SARS had worked, um, we wouldn't be having this conversation. And certainly, um, and I'm a big supporter of and defender of the World Health Organization, um, but if we collectively had built the kind of World Health Organization that we need, rather than the one that was politically feasible, um, the World Health Organization could have played this kind of really, could have had its own uh, independent surveillance network. It could have had emergency response teams um, with planes fueled and ready to go that in the first moment's notice could fly to a, a, hot, a hot zone uh, and they would be like weapons inspectors where that country, if they tried to block the WHO access, it would be immediately referred uh, to the Security Council. I mean, we could really, we could imagine how it works and then we can go back from there and say, what's the difference between what we actually need and what we, and what we have. So this connects me to a, a broader uh, question on one, there's the issue of, of global public health. But two, if we were imagining a platform infrastructure so that we weren't just starting from scratch, because that's, I think, what we're seeing is that where it's as if we're starting from scratch when we could have had platforms in place for vaccines, for treatments and other things where we would be halfway, halfway that we could speed up the responses and then thinking of platform responses, and I know George, you're thinking a lot ab about this. Are there ways of uh, responding to whole categories of viruses or creating uh, antiviral strategies like the, the um, Cas13 Pac-Man that Stanley Chi and others are, are, are writing about? But what, what would it mean for, for you, uh, George, um, to get, oh, sorry about that, this is what happens when you're in quarantine and someone comes to the door. Um, for you, George, to say, if we wanted to be prepared with platforms ready for this kind of crisis, how would we do it? Well, well, so there's two kinds of platforms. One would be diagnostic and the other is therapeutic. And, and this is one of those cases where diagnostic isn't just telling you what ther therapeutic to use. It can also, it can also uh, result in strategies that don't involve drugs or vaccines. So for example, if you have a platform for testing that's good enough, it can you can by isolation you can um, solve the problem. And whatever we may say about how much better we should have made the World Health Organization and and hopefully will in the future, there were parts of the world that were where it worked beautifully. Uh, the the uh, testing was and isolation was sufficient, and it would have been sufficient worldwide as well, as if every country or the countries that were highly interconnected uh, had the same quality of uh, compliance, testing, and so forth. Compliance is a big problem uh, in certain countries uh, where people take perverse pleasure in um, improving their freedom by being non-compliant. Uh, um, so uh, the other kind of platform, so that's a testing platform, which can by itself work. 
and the other one is is uh, via therapeutics uh, or uh, synthetic biology. We we've uh, been working on a way that we can make any organism, any cell or organism resistant to all viruses, including viruses we've never seen before. Uh, that's not that would not have been ready for COVID. Uh, without a, a substantial change in, in, in funding. But the point is it could be ready someday and it probably will first be ready for agricultural species, plants and animals. Uh, so that's one approach. And that's a completely general approach. You can do that in advance. Uh, you don't need to know what virus is coming out of nowhere. There are other ones that are a little more crafted where it would be helpful, again, getting back to the diagnostic end, if we were going out into the wild and doing zoonotic surveys, surveys for um, pathogens, both um, viruses and non-virus pathogens that might be coming out uh, of the wild and into our uh, homes soon. So, all right, that, so Ellen, um, I'm glad that you said that your business uh, is not altering the uh, human genome to create humans for 200 years from now. But your statement, which I uh, agreed with, um, is getting a lot of uh, of interest in the uh, in the chat and the questions that are uh, that are being raised. So, uh, paraphrasing uh, what's been uh, what's been asked, um, if we overtake evolution and humans, we already have this this seemingly privileged uh, place in the world. Although bacteria and viruses are doing pretty well, thank you very much. Uh, um, uh, what what does that mean if we change our role what does that mean for the rest of the ecosystem uh and then uh for uh george um one of my favorite things is your running list of if we once we start thinking about uh changes to the human genome like where do we start and you have the the, the list that I, I reference in in hacking darwin um about kind of what what might be like the the first steps um so Ellen, how do we think about our entire biosphere um, when we think about potentially changing humans? Well, I mean, you touched on this in the very beginning of your book. It's this idea that there is a natural world and that there's something that's known as natural uh, is an idea that pervades our, our consciousness, but in some ways is just a construct because we're seeing humans have been on earth for a very short slice of time. And when we say natural in a lot of ways, we mean what's comfortable for us and what's enjoyable for us. I mean, no one wants to see white tigers go away. Nobody wants to cut down all the forests and uh, the, the forests and, and have uh, you know no oxygen left for us to survive. But you can bet that something would evolve and survive on the planet almost no matter what. So, uh, I think we have to take a hard look at what we've done um, just in the time that we've been here to change nature and really ask ourselves, is doing it through modern technology really any different? It, it, it means that things happen faster, but as George said, we're much more sophisticated in setting up um, rules and regulations and, 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 and sort of containing that within a safe space. Uh, the, the bigger question is, you know, what do we want our relationship to be with nature? Uh, we sort of always want to have our cake and eat it too. We want to have uh, endless food and endless energy and not disrupt anything at all and still have pristine places uh, and, and an ecosystem that works. But this is probably the biggest question that the future generations are going to have to answer is, yeah. is how do we live with this? And unfortunately, I think that we we already are, are are carving it into the image that we want in in just a huge number of ways. So we might as well admit it and try to do it in the best way possible. Yeah, I I, I agree with you. Agreeing with me. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that so, was easy. Yeah, exactly. Um, so George, how, how do you see, I mean, you, you made a, a very valid and important point that everybody goes galloping straight to the germline when thinking about uh, the future evolution of humans. And that's just one application. Although it seems to me extremely likely that 
um, it's going to be one of the approaches that we're going to use. And, and, I, and especially at a time like now, if somebody were to say um, that we could make a small number of, uh, of genetic changes and the harms would be relatively small, but they could confer outsized benefits, I think a lot of people would at least think about it. So um, let's focus this on germline. Uh, but George, how do you see the kind of the progression of, uh, of germline uh, genetic modifi uh, modifications? Because of course we have the th first three CRISPR babies that we know of, maybe maybe more. Yeah, so I mean, the, 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 the answer of which is the first for germline is already answered. It's, it's CCR5 resistance to HIV. Um, whether that's <clears throat> what we would have come up with if we uh, had a, a, a vote of all people or of all scientists, it's not clear, but it's, a, it's the first. Um, I th the reason I think the germline is overemphasized is that uh, it's, uh, it's expensive. Uh, it uh, is, um, there are other ways of doing it. You can, you can alter a, a lot of rare diseases with uh, genetic counseling, which is much less expensive than gene therapy. Uh, there is somatic gene therapy that will work on many things. My guess is the first that will be broadly accepted. It's not clear that the CCR5 for anti-HIV is going to be widely adopted, even if, even if it's safe and effective, which remains to be seen with the first three uh, children that are born. Um, it still may not be popular. It could, it could be a cost issue. It could be a competing methodology. There are many ways of, of avoiding or curing or reversing uh, HIV that does not involve germline. Um, but I think the first ones will probably be things that, that a lot of people can benefit from, like aging that we've talked about before, that, that will be low cost like aging because so many people can uh, participate in it. Another first might be uh, things that we need off planet, uh, things like radiation resistance and uh, gravity uh, and microgravity tolerance, uh, which are hard to, uh, uh, to achieve, um, might be hard to achieve by somatic therapies or therapies that have, you have during life. But I think there will be a blurring where so many of these things will be achievable um, in a way that doesn't involve, that's voluntary and is done uh, after the age of consent is, is reasonable. Um, that, that if you can also do it, if you do, the, do it over and over for many uh, years, um, that will be um, widely uh, accepted. And I think there, there are some things that germline is, has slight advantages. So for example, um, when you uh, do a somatic gene therapy, every cell, billions of cells, gets a different off-target, while when you do germline, which we do quite frequently in agricultural animals or animals t targeted for transplantation, you make, you make a change in one cell and the, the probability of going off-target uh, is a billion times better. So I could go on with a, a, a slight advantages of gene, germline, but the point is there are going to be alternatives and they will blur and uh, and uh, and and people will will not really even care um, which one it is they're using. Uh, I think the real I'm biting I'm biting my tongue, George. I mean, to get rid of sickle cell disease, for example, you wouldn't want to make the change in one individual and their entire family yeah. for the rest of their generations that's, that's won't a, have to a, suffer horribly. That's that's a, a big uh, cost and compliance uh, advantage. Um, but but you could also do it uh, by genetic counseling. That's what's happened with Tay-Sachs, which is very similar in inheritance to sickle cell. Tay-Sachs is almost completely eliminated from the families that practice uh, genetic counseling at a much lower cost. Um, but so, you're right. If you do it in the germline, then the cost is zero. It's like smallpox. Yeah. All subsequent generations benefit from it. So from a ethics of egalitarian distribution, if it's safe. The problem is it takes longer to test uh, germline consequences. That's, I think that's the main, yeah. sometimes unstated problem is it takes 20, 60 years to debug uh, clinical trial in germline. Yeah, so it's still feasible. It's yeah, still yeah. And, and I think that, that it, we're all agreeing that there's going to be, a, a, that we know what the potential problems are to be solved. 
and there'll be multiple ways of solving them and different people will have different comfort levels with different approaches and some approaches may prove more cost effective or more accurate or more socially acceptable along uh, along the way so before i we're, we're just about to run out of time and and before i um turn it back over to steffi i'd like to say one final comment that kind of pulls all of these uh, these pieces together and that is this science doesn't exist in a vacuum it exists within the context of our societies um and because of that we're seeing this democratization of everything including literacy access decision making hopefully um it means that conversations like this are now more important than ever before uh because these are big civilization level decisions and even if the most well intentioned scientists or a few government leaders in the most uh, developed countries or any small groups of people make even the most well intentioned decisions on behalf of everybody else the result is going to be a lot of anger and a lot of chaos and so these kinds of inclusive conversations that that DLD is hosting and others are is is not just entertainment this is part of the process of advancing science within a a re responsible social context. So with that, my thank yous to Ellen and George and Steffi, but over to you Steffi. Thank you so much. Thank you three panelists. This was an amazing conversation. And I'm sure we all have to do this much more often. It can be only the beginning of a broader, as you said, uh, Jamie of a broader discussion and conversation. We have to give us awareness about what's going on. And Ellen, you always said this, and really let's work together to make our, our states, our, um, our, every one of us more aware about this amazing evolution of humankind, of our nature, of our world. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really, touched by your conversation because I see the many, many implications of that what's going on. And we should be very, very look clo looking closely at this evolution. And thank you for coming. Thank you so much. You made thank me more Stephanie. awake and you made me even more curious. And I hope the DID community, you feel the same. It can be only the beginning of getting more involved, more engaged in our education, in our awareness about what's going on. Thank you all for being here. I have to announce on the, it's, it's a new DLD think talk on June 3rd with Carlo Ratti from the MIT. He thinks he's an inventor and disruptor and architect, member of the MIT um, faculty. And he will talk about the new image or the new cities we are going to face. Thank you for being at DLD Think. Hope to see you very soon again. Bye. <laughs>